Hey everyone, my name is Christy Daly and welcome to Southern Gables Online. Thank you so much for tuning in online with us today. You may be watching today and you're not normally part of our church family. We are so glad to have you. We would ask everyone to click the Sunday register button below where you're watching on the website, or you can go to the SGC app as well. Just fill out the form to let us know that you're watching. And also be sure to let us know how we can pray for you or if you have any additional needs. Earlier this week, we sent out a video update from Pastor Jeff regarding the COVID-19 situation. On the video, he discusses both some practical and biblical considerations. If you didn't get a chance to watch the video, please do so. If you don't get our weekly emails, send us a note to get on the list, but you can also watch the video on the homepage. Just click Video from Pastor Jeff button. A few months ago, Southern Gables formed a worship director search team. To date, more than 40 people have applied for the position, and the team has been praying and working diligently to determine who the Lord would have lead our worship ministry. The team has interviewed a number of people and has had in-depth discussions with a couple of really promising candidates. So please continue to pray that the Lord would guide the search team and the elders during this process. Thank you so much for listening. Now let's continue to worship the Lord together. Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are. It's our hope to just have a moment to pause and, and spend time with the Lord together. And so uh, as we start, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, would you just center our hearts on you? Would you tune our hearts to sing your grace? Fix our eyes on you, Lord, and help us to know you more and respond to your love and your action in our life. We ask amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
Amen. Well, we want to continue worshiping our Lord together. And this next song may be a newer song. It's uh, called So Will I. And uh, I love how in Colossians there's mention of creation, that everything was made in Christ and for him and through him. And so as we sing this next song, maybe you've made some summer memories already of being outdoors and enjoying God's creation, and it all points to Him. It's all worshiping and praising Him already. And so we want to join with creation in praising Him. It's all for Him. And so, uh, yeah, sing along when you get the hang of it.
attention to these words as we tell the story of Jesus. Oh Lord, would you bring us closer to you today and wrapped into your story that you have come to die in our place. That we could be made right with you. Our, our debt paid in full. So Lord, help us to celebrate as we hear a familiar story and sing a song. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. The silence still and all Oh, 
The blazing sun shall be set alight, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, Jesus, center our thoughts on you more and more. Lord, if there's anything that is ahead of you in our life, Lord, help us to cast that aside. And Lord, truly to be satisfied in finding ourselves in you, Lord. So let's sing this. We'll praise the name. Sing it from your heart. worship you above all. You are the name above all names, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And Lord, even though you created the universe, you reach down and you love us. You've shown your love for us through your Son. And so, Lord, would you fix our eyes and turn our lives toward you more and more. Help us to hear your voice today. Help us to, to worship you with our life, not just our song, but with our obedience, with our willingness to follow. And Lord, with our ear bent to you, we want to do your word. So help us to hear your voice. We ask in your name. Amen. Hey, good morning, Southern Gables Church. Welcome. Welcome to Southern Gables Online. For those of you who are new, my name is Jeff Daly. I'm the lead pastor. I'm glad you're here this morning. Okay, get your Bible out, get it ready, because today I get to tell you about Jesus as we continue this series in Colossians called Just Jesus. Jesus is the most significant person in all of human history, right? We keep track of time based on his life. We have B.C. and we have A.D., Hundreds of millions of people worship him as Lord and God and Savior and King this morning. Almost the entire world stops to celebrate Christmas and to celebrate Easter. There have been more books written about him, more songs sung about him, more paintings painted about him than any other figure in human history. There is nobody like Jesus. One time, Jesus asked his disciples a very important question. Who do you say that I am? 
And he's asking us the exact same question today. Who do you say that I am? And how you answer that question is the most important thing about you. And you know what? Everybody has an opinion about Jesus. Okay, and there's no shortage of contradictory answers to that clarifying question, who do you say that I am? Ask a Jehovah's Witness friend, and they will say that Jesus is not creator God, but rather he's a created being. They will say that he's actually the archangel Michael. Ask a Christian scientist friend who follows the teachings of Eddie Mary Baker, who is interesting because there's really no Christian and there's no science in Christian science, and you will hear from their founder that Jesus Christ is not God. Ask your Muslim friend, and he will say that Jesus is a prophet, yes, but an inferior prophet to their superior prophet, Muhammad. Ask a Hindu friend, and they will have a pantheon of ideas about Jesus. Okay, most saying that Jesus was an enlightened holy man, but not the holiest man who ever lived. Ask your Buddhist friend, and they will say that Jesus was a fairly enlightened individual, but not as enlightened as the Buddha. Everybody has an opinion about Jesus. And this is the question we're asking this morning and answering, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And to find that answer, we are looking to the Apostle Paul, who's writing to the Colossians while he's imprisoned in Rome. Paul is writing because he wants us to correctly answer this question, who is Jesus? And he wants us to see that if we have Jesus, we have all that we need. That Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That you are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's dive into Colossians 1 this morning, beginning in verse 15, where we left off last Sunday. We're going to see, get this, 10 key truths about Jesus. And friends, what I want you to see this morning with me is that Jesus is awesome. Okay, Jesus is awesome. Jesus is awesome because number one, he is the image of the invisible God. Look at verse 15 with me. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, God is invisible. He's immaterial and he's supernatural. God is spirit. We don't know who God is because we cannot see him. But now, Jesus makes the invisible God visible. Jesus makes the unknown God knowable. What is an image? An image is a reflection, right? Or the likeness of something. Now, when I got up this morning, I looked in the mirror, and honestly, I was pretty disappointed. Now, maybe you feel that way when you look at yourself. And it made me think, how come my nose is so big? Why are my ears crooked? It's like I got two different sets of ears. And where did all of my dark brown hair go? But the mirror accurately reflected my image. Unfortunately, Jesus is the image. He is the mirror reflecting the character of the Father. Jesus' love is the Father's love. Jesus' truth is the Father's truth. Jesus' forgiveness is the Father's Forgiveness. This is why Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Do you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Paul says that Jesus is the icon. Okay, the icon of the invisible God. Icons are images that are used to provide people with a physical representation of invisible things. And many different religions use them to depict their gods. But we are not dependent upon these for worship because we have Jesus. Jesus is our visible point of connection between heaven and earth, between us and the Father in heaven. Everything we need to know about God is found in Jesus. So if you're confused about life, begin with Jesus. Look to Jesus, study Jesus, research Jesus, Pray to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the human face of God. If you want to meet with God, you don't go to a place, you don't go to a building, you don't go to a a priest, but rather you go to a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is the image of the invisible God. And secondly, Jesus is the ruler over all creation. That's why he's awesome. Again, verse 15, he is the firstborn over all creation. 
Now, this verse has caused a lot of confusion through the years. Jehovah's Witnesses love to point to this verse as evidence that Jesus is a created being. After all, it says that he is the firstborn over all creation. In other words, they contend, there was a time when Jesus was not. Therefore, he's not God. But this isn't what the phrase firstborn over all creation means. Firstborn in the Bible has two different meanings. Okay, sometimes it refers to the one who was born first. And other times it refers to the person who occupies first position. For example, think of military rank. If someone occupies first rank, it means that they are in a position of leadership. It means that they are in charge. Not that they were born before the other soldiers. Firstborn means that Jesus occupies first position and first rank, that he's in charge of all creation. Firstborn can also speak of inheritance because in biblical times, it was the firstborn son who inherited everything. Everything belonged to him. So taken together, Jesus occupies the highest position and all of creation belongs to him. This is what firstborn refers to, not to Jesus being a created being. Our Jehovah's Witnesses friends are very wrong about Jesus. Their answer to the question, who is Jesus, is very different from our answer. Okay, here's what this means. Jesus first. Jesus first. Jesus is first in our relationships. Jesus is first in our identity. Jesus is first in our families. Jesus is first in what we eat. Jesus is first in the church. Jesus should be first in our finances. Jesus should be first in our politics. Jesus is first in our work. Why? Because Jesus is first. Listen, if your life is a mess, nothing will ever get straightened out in your life until Jesus is in first position. You're not going to have peace or purpose or fullness until Jesus is Lord of your life and he occupies first place. Paul puts Jesus first right at the beginning in the book of Colossians because all the problems he's going to address later on cannot be conquered until Jesus occupies first place. Okay, Jesus is like a GPS that will always lead us in the right direction. We must first establish true north. And Jesus is true north, then we are in a position to orient everything else in our lives around Jesus. And when we do that, confounding issues become clear and crooked paths become straight. Let me ask you, is there an area of your life where you're frustrated and just can't seem to get it? Could it be that you're trying to chart a course without putting Jesus first? Number three, Jesus is creator of all. Jesus is creator of all. If you're still not convinced that Jesus is something more than a good teacher, verse 16 clears up the confusion. Look at it. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I mean, any questions? Could it get any clearer? Jesus is creator of all. All things were made by Jesus. All things exist for Jesus, whether seen or unseen. Everything you see belongs to Jesus. Everything that you cannot see. Angels in heaven and demons here on earth below were created by Jesus. And ultimately, they exist for Jesus. Jesus Christ occupies top spot in all of creation because he's creator of all. This is why Paul says in Romans eleven thirty six, 36, beautiful verse, that for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What does this mean? It means that everyone and everything belongs to Jesus, the creator. Everyone and everything will go to Jesus and will give an account to him. The history of the world is going to a throne, and on that throne is seated Jesus. And friends, there are no detours around the throne. Everyone is going to stand before Jesus. Okay, presidents and politicians and kings and mighty men and generals and warlords and dictators and doctors and pastors and priests and politicians and police officers and CEOs and dog catchers. 
We do not live independent, autonomous lives. We came from God and we will return to God. Anything other than that is an illusion and it's a delusion because we are created by Jesus for Jesus. Now listen, if you don't know, love, and serve Jesus, you're divorced from the purpose for which you were created. You are a creature that does not know your creator. If you're missing out on a relationship with Jesus, come to Jesus today. It's not too late. Jesus promises that he can restore the years of your life that have been wasted. And number four, Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. Look at verse 17. And he is before all things. Okay, Jesus is eternal. Jesus has no birthday cake, no beginning of years, no ending of years. Before there ever was anything, Jesus was. He is before all things. Now, some groups in the kingdom of the cults will say that Jesus is a good man, but he's not the God man. Or that he did not come into existence until he was conceived in the womb of his mother Mary. That is not true. That is not true. Jesus is eternal God who has entered into human history, but his birth through the womb of Mary was not the beginning of his life. No. Right? He existed long before he was born into this world. Jesus has always been, and he has always been God. In eternity past, he existed with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He existed in spirit form. And at the time of the incarnation, when we celebrate Christmas each and every year, he took on an additional nature and he was found in the appearance of a man. He's always been God, but at the time of Christmas, he became the God-man. It's been said that a thousand times in history, a baby has become a king. But only once in history has a king become a baby. Number five, Jesus is the sustainer. Jesus is awesome because he's the sustainer. Check out the second half of verse 17 with me. And in him, all things hold together. Okay, now this is the exact opposite belief from what many people believe, namely deism. Deism is the belief that God created the world and he wound it up like a clock and he threw it out there and now he has retreated to some distant planet where he is sipping an iced tea. Deism believes that God is like an absentee watchmaker. Okay, that he wound the universe up, he started it, and then he withdrew. Deists believe that God lets the world run by natural law and is no longer actively involved. And you know what? Many people today see God that way. They see God through the lens of their earthly father who fathered them and then abandoned them. They believe that God is not a personal, loving God who's actively involved in his creation. Therefore, he is not involved with them and he does not care about them in any significant way. But this is not how the Bible presents the person and works of Jesus Christ. According to the Bible, Jesus creates and sustains. He holds all things together by his active, intentional, powerful, loving work in this world. You know the old kid's song. He's got the whole world in his hands. It's true, right? It's good theology. When it feels like this world is exploding and falling apart, and that's the way it feels right now, Jesus holds it together. And just because it's out of our hands does not mean that it's out of Jesus' hands. If your life is falling apart, give it to Jesus. He holds it together. If your marriage is falling apart, humble yourself. Okay, and stop pursuing a divorce and give it to Jesus because he can hold it together. He can heal it. If your family is falling apart, give it to Jesus. The same Jesus who holds the atomic structure together in his hands and by his power is the one who holds your life together. This means that when everything is falling apart in your life, you can take your hands off it and you can confidently place it into the hands of of big Jesus. Let me ask you, what are you trying to hold together right now in your own power? Will you place that in Jesus' hands today? He will do a better job with it than you can. Number eight, Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is awesome because he's head of the church. That's verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. Now listen, we live in a day and age where it's fashionable to be critical of the church. 
Okay, the church is like a low-hanging pinata on Cinco de Mayo. Everybody is beating and criticizing the church and exposing her faults and failures. Now question, how many of you men like it when people trash your wife? Okay, if you insult my wife, you insult me. And it's the same way with Jesus and the church. The church metaphorically is his bride. When we speak ill of the church, it offends Jesus. Jesus loves his church. Jesus died for his church. Jesus is devoted to his church. And Jesus is the head of the church, which is the body of Christ. Okay, this is one of Paul's favorite metaphors for the church. Jesus is the head of the church, and we, his people, are the body of Christ. Now listen, tremendous problems arise when this simple truth is overlooked. I am not the head of the church. Okay, the staff, elders, deacons, committees are not the head of the church. Oftentimes in the church, we have different factions that are warring in order to get their way and their will. It's a battle over who's going to be in charge. Our goal is not to fight over what we want, but to seek Jesus and to do what he wants. The church, get this, is ruled, thrown down, not pew up. Even though we are congregational, we do not always pull the people to see what they want. We pray and we say, Jesus, what do you want? Listen, in the American church, consumerism has supplanted Christ. If you're in business, if you supply goods and services for your customers, what's the saying? The customer is always right. But when the church sees itself as a business and you as the customers then it's tragic because people say, I don't like this part of the Bible or I don't like what it says about hell. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about judgment. Don't talk about repentance. If the customer doesn't like it, then don't sell it. Why? Because the customer is always right, right? So what do we do? We change the menu in the church and we feed the customer what he likes. Then the customer gets sick and weak because they've been pandered to with a steady diet of sugar and junk food. But we are not ruled by consumerism. We are ruled by Christ. We need to rediscover our proper place in this metaphor. We are not the customer. Okay, in the strictest sense, Jesus is. When we die, we give an account to Jesus, not to a mirror. So we should be more concerned with offending Jesus than people. Jesus is our highest authority. Number seven, Jesus is awesome because Jesus is alive. Look at verse 18. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. This is awesome. We are meeting this morning because Jesus is alive. You know that. Many of you know that. And you say, yeah, I know that. That's old news. Tell me something new. No. Okay, it's the same awesome news all the time that there's nobody like Jesus who died for us and he's now alive. When somebody important dies like Kobe Bryant, that was tragic. Their tomb is oftentimes venerated. Okay, people show up there with candles and flowers and they say prayers. If you go to Israel today, you can visit the tombs of prominent biblical characters like Father Abraham or King David, and you can light a candle and you can say a prayer. Everybody knows where their tombs are because they are venerated. But it's different with Jesus. Back in the day of the Gospels, everybody knew where Jesus was buried. Okay, the Roman authorities placed Jesus in the grave. They rolled the stone in place. They sealed the tomb. And get this, they placed guards in front of it, right? Everybody knew where the tomb of Jesus was at. Yet it was never venerated. Why? Because it was empty, right? Because Jesus didn't stay dead. The tomb is empty. He, he's alive and he's cooking breakfast for his disciples. He's proving himself to be alive over a period of 40 days talking about the kingdom of God. And if you go to Israel today, the best tour guides can do is take you to a couple of spots and say, this might have been the place where Jesus was buried. They can take you to a hole in the ground. Why? Because you don't venerate someone who is alive. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, meaning those who believe in Jesus will follow after him in his example. This, my friends, is awesome. 
Okay, death is merely a doorway into the fullness of life in the presence of Jesus. Because Jesus lives, we too shall live. Number eight, Jesus is the God-man. He's the God-man. Look at verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Okay, Jesus is fully God. This is huge. Who is your God? I've heard people say through the years, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Wrong. Wrong. They didn't kill him for feeding the hungry. They didn't kill him for including women and outcasts as his disciples. They killed him because he claimed to be God. Jesus is the only one of all of the religious figures who claim to be God. Not the Buddha, not Confucius, not Muhammad. They killed Jesus, then three days later he came back and he said, I told you so. You didn't listen to me. Okay, this is the clearest verse in all of the Bible concerning the divinity of Christ. Look at it. It says, for in him all. You see that all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. God the Son was very pleased, very happy to be found in appearance as a man. This is the creator entering into his creation. Uh, Some people say, you know, all religions basically teach the same thing. No, they don't. Do not believe that for a moment. We believe that Jesus is God, not just a good man, but the God man. Let me ask you, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you love him? Do you serve him? Number nine, Jesus is awesome because Jesus is the reconciler. He's the reconciler. What happens with all of us is that we have difficult, severed, painful relationships with other people. Okay, maybe you came with one today. Okay, don't don't look at them right now. Don't, Don't tilt your head because they'll know. Just kind of shift your eyes over. God is holy and he created us for a relationship with him, but our relationship with him is severed because of sin and it needs to be reconciled. So look at verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. We don't have the peace of God or peace with God because our sin is a declaration of war against the holy God. It's cosmic treason. So by nature, we have an acrimonious, unreconciled relationship with God, and we need peace with God. And the only way that we can have peace with God is if our sin and our transgression is dealt with. So what does God do? God sends his son to live the perfect life that you or I could never live. He goes to the cross and he dies the death that we deserve. He substitutes himself. He dies in your place and in my place and he pays the price and he takes the penalty to give us a gift that we cannot earn. Okay, how many of you would die for your enemy? It's one thing to die for those who love you, but it's another thing to die for those who hate you. And at the cross, we see God is loving those who hate him. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you don't have peace with God. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the saving Lord, but you think to yourself, you know, I'm at peace with God. That's evidence that you're really at war with God because in effect, you're calling God a liar and you're saying, Jesus didn't need to die for me. I don't need to be reconciled to God. Yes, you do. Either you will be reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today, or you will be eternally lost forever. I appeal to your enlightened self-interest. Be reconciled to God today. If you need to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, the saving Lord, and he will shower you with all of his favor. Number 10, Jesus is awesome because Jesus is the only savior. Friends, there is no plan B, no other option, no other path, no other alternatives. It says, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Here we see the before and after for those who meet the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Before you met the Lord Jesus Christ, you had a problem with your head. You were hostile in mind, Paul says. You were resistant. You were self-righteous. You were self-justifying. There was a small defense attorney in all of us that was resistant to the truth. This head problem you had led to a heart problem, and the heart problem led to a hands problem because Paul says that we were doing evil deeds. Uh, head and heart and hands were all working in unison to resist God. This is who you once were. But Paul says he has now reconciled you. Okay, he gave you a new heart and a new mind. You started to think about Jesus and his word and you wanted to please Jesus. What you used to love, you now hate. And what you used to hate, you now love. Now you want to be like Jesus. Friends, it is a full transformation. So here's the issue. If you claim that you've been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, are you, like it says in verse 23, look at that, continuing in the faith? It's great to be born into a Christian family, to listen to Christian music, to go to church. But your most important day, in a sense, is your last day. Are you still loving and serving and worshiping Jesus? Are you continuing steadfast, not getting off course, not being led away? All of the promises of God are yours in Christ, if indeed you continue in the faith. Now, here's the big picture. There is a great worship service that is taking place in heaven right now with Jesus Christ seated on his throne. Day and night, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. The elders are face down before the throne of God. Billions of souls are before him right now. And his name is Jesus, ruler, creator, sustainer, firstborn from the dead, okay, head of the church, the God-man, the reconciler, the savior of the world. And this Jesus will return for his own. And one day heaven and earth will become one. And here in just a moment, we're going to join our voices together with billions of other souls in worship of Jesus. Why? Because he is truly awesome. He's awesome. You know, we really misuse that word. We use the word awesome for anything and everything under the sun. We say that pizza was awesome, right? But the word awesome should be reserved for just Jesus, for just Jesus. So let's lift up our voices in praise to our awesome Jesus. And as we lift our voices up to Jesus, let's also open up our hearts to Jesus. Maybe some of you this morning need to recommit yourself to following Jesus. And maybe some of you need to trust in Jesus Christ, the saving Lord, for the first time. The good news is all of heaven is poised to forgive and to welcome you with all the radiance of the Father's embrace. So if you need to put your trust in Jesus Christ right now. Let's lift our voices together in worship to our awesome Jesus.
Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I'm glad you could join us. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you tremendous peace. Have a great week. And as you go, remember how awesome our Jesus is. Shalom.